Hello tanks and tankettes and welcome to something of an experiment and also a bit of bonus content really. This is going out alongside I don't even know what but uh, something. This is a lesson I held for SGTA and uh, basically in collaboration with SGTA uh, whom you may know I am a former instructor for the Specialist Global Tank Academy. Uh, basically in order to uh, raise the profile of SGTA and also maybe give out some useful information on my channel, um, I'm going to be doing some semi-regular lessons with them and basically recording it and putting it up on the channel so that uh, everyone can get the benefit of my um, wisdom. I'm not sure what caption guy would say about that. but. Uh, Anyway, so basically you're about to see a 25-30 minute-ish lesson on the basics of heavy tanks. If you are reasonably experienced with World of Tanks then uh, you can probably skip this, it won't be anything that you don't know, but you might find it useful as a refresher if you're less sure of yourself or if you're new to the game, well that's basically where it's bit pitched at. It's uh, meant for those people that uh, are coming to this with not a great amount of experience. So without further ado, I present me giving a heavy tank lesson. Right, so we're doing he basic heavy tank um, like theory in this, in this lesson. It shouldn't take too long. I'm hoping to keep it within half an hour. I've got a list of bullet points basically and it's mostly from the curriculum SGTA materials which you can go and read if you want a little more depth um, but basically yeah it, it's going to be covering what heavy tanks are and what they should in theory be doing on the battlefield so I've got a variety of heavy tanks in here which is good because uh, not all heavy tanks are equal of course and um, you've, you've I mean basically heavy tanks one of the defining things, or a couple of the defining things about them are they tend to have more armor, they tend to have more health than anything else, uh, they tend to have bigger guns than mediums but smaller than uh, tank destroyers, and uh, generally speaking they're not nearly as fast as mediums, although uh, there are obviously some exceptions to that, and uh, at least at the mid tiers and the, the getting towards the higher tiers they tend to not have very good view ranges either, so you're relying on other people for your vision. So we can all just cluster up in the town square I guess for this bit. So the, the different kinds of heavy tank, and we've got a nice spread here, so they kind of range from um, brawling heavies, which is things like the, well, the IS-7 is the archetypal brawling high tier heavy, you've, you've got your rather large, Who's slow, heavily armoured heavies like um, the Mouse or the Black Prince is a good example, we've got one of those right here. You've got some that have um, uh, kind of and almost a specialization in going hull down and obviously the uh, Americans are particularly known for that, the, the T-29 and the T-32. And then you have the ones that are kind of awkward, they're not quite fitting in any of the other roles but they're, you know, they're not particularly armored, they maybe don't have the best guns but they're faster <coughs> than the others and the French fall into that category. The Autel Odors are almost a separate lesson in their own right, in fact they probably are a separate lesson in their own right. But not only those, you've also got tanks like the FCM-50T or the VK-4501 which um, it, it's maybe more mobile than uh, other media uh, heavies but doesn't it doesn't quite have the speed of a medium but it's it's not really got the armor of a heavy although it does have the, the hit points of a heavy. So there's a bit of a spread and that makes it hard to say you should always go here and you should always do this in your heavy tank. You need to think about what heavy tank you're in because what is correct in a mouse might be a really terrible idea in an AMX 50B for instance. Now as to what you should actually be doing with your heavy tank when it uh, comes to being on the battlefield, well I picked out Ensk because Ensk is a, a really good uh, example. Now the first thing you should do when you're starting off any random battle is have a look at the team list and have a look at the, the map that you're on. And the map, well, hopefully you will have played enough or you'll have maybe done some uh, map lessons and you can uh, have an idea of roughly where different classes of vehicle will go on each map. And in Ensk what tends to happen is the heavies come and fight in the town. You've got the mediums and the lights going and um, using the 890 line which is kind of the more open field area with a bit of bush cover and 
tank destroyers, well, you maybe will find them on the 890 line, or sometimes you'll find them covering the 1-2 line, and artillery tends to be back along the 1-2-3 the line somewhere as well, but not always. If it's an encounter battle, certainly when everyone spawns over on the field, they'll tend to be more over on that uh, eastern side. But either way, looking at the map and, and knowing what's on your um, opposing team uh, is, you know, if you start on Ensk and you're in a heavy tank, but the enemy team doesn't have any top tier heavy tanks and they've all top tier mediums, then it's very likely they're just going to rush across the field rather than come and fight in the town. And you should maybe think about that and adjust your tactics accordingly. Maybe you don't want to go fight in the, in the town. Maybe you want to go and uh, take up a more defensive position on the, the field side. Uh, so, you know, you, you've got to think about these things. I, I'm, not quite, I'm not quite liking how uh, all these tanks are looking at me. <laughs> sitting there, it's very close. Anyway, um, let, let's just hope, you know, trigger discipline, that's another thing. Hold your shots till the end of the battle. Uh, so. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, once you've um, you've had a look at the team list and figured out where you, is you want to go, uh, you should try and get yourself into ideally a position with some cover until you figure out how many enemies you're facing because you're not going to know that right away. Now, I would highly recommend, as it is a default part of the, the client these days, you don't need mods for it, turning on the minimap labels so you can see the uh, exactly what you're facing and you can see the traces of what is where. So, in a, 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 a battle being fought on this area in Ensk, for instance, um, it's typically this alley ahead of us and coming from the south side, quite often you'll get tanks will push out in here and the tanks on the enemy side will be inside that square and everyone will pull side scrape and try and trade shots for a while and uh, if you've got the superior numbers well provided I, I mean if you know for a fact there's no tanks on the one line that can be very valuable as an area to flank because of both these areas um, to the north and south, uh, to the immediate north and south, they've both got openings along the one line. So you can use that as a powerful flanking tool, but that is, just assuming there's no tank destroyers there, um, it's, if you if you know there are tank destroyers on the enemy team and they haven't been spotted yet, then it's a good bet that one of them might very well be there, in which case, just blindly pushing out and trying to rush around is probably a bad plan. But if you know, for instance, from your minimap traces that they're all spotted on the field, then the chances are pretty good that you can push around. Although there might still be a heavy tank or a medium lurking back there. But um, basically, yeah, knowing how much of the enemy in front of you is, uh, is really quite valuable in terms of knowing what to do next. And so let's in this case say that you know you outnumber the enemy and you're, you're on this flank. And that, that means the, your team's outnumbered on the enemy flank. But let's just say that flank is very static and you don't have to worry about that for these purposes. Well, if you know there's nothing facing down the one line, then this would be a perfect opportunity to either wait for your allies to go round or to go round yourself, depending on what kind of a heavy tank you're in. Now, if you're in something like a mouse, for instance, or a lure, as you can see Lewis uh, just having flipped his uh, tank on the side, um, um. it would probably be better to stick around in this area, side scrape, try and trade shots, occupy the enemy's attention while your allies are going round. However, something like the IS-2 or the 50B, where you've got a bit more mobility, then you might well want to be the one doing the flanking yourself. However, if everybody, of course, is pushing round the flank, the enemy is very quickly going to figure out what's going on, and so they're all going to turn to face you. So you need to keep up the pressure from all sides, basically. So, of course, when you're side scraping, one little note I do want to make is be aware of artillery. It's not that much of a, an issue when you're side scraping off these buildings in uh, in this particular map. So, for instance, if you're side scraping off there or if you're side scraping off the other side, artillery's probably not going to have much of a shot at you. But there are other maps where you'll be quite happily side scraping away, and then suddenly a big old arty shell splashes next to you and. It doesn't matter that you're side scraping, you're just going to take a bunch of damage anyway. So, another thing to be aware of. And sometimes it's safe to do it regardless because Artie's going to be focused elsewhere. But if you do take the risk, then, uh, yeah. Also, yeah, I'm sure. sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh my god. So, um, I've talked about when you might want to push as a specific example on this, um, this particular map. 
um, knowing what your enemy team is, is uh, doing, trying to figure out what they're doing from the minimap, I mean that's a really important part of, of any battle, and just generally um, that, that kind of uh, situational awareness, as we call it, is going to be one of the most important skills you can learn in this game. So. Um, always, I can't really emphasize this enough, always pay attention to the minimap. It will tell you a lot of information and sometimes paying attention to what individual players are doing as well. I mean, if you've got a bunch of enemies that are being very hesitant, if they're backing off, for instance, if you've got a couple of heavies spotted in this, um, well, the, on either side of this corner and they're being very, very hesitant, then Use it's quite possible that they don't actually have the numbers and if you're all sat there staring at each other then the action is going to go on the other f on on the other flank the superior enemy force is going to push round from behind and suddenly you're encircled so sometimes if you've got a couple of enemy tanks in front of you being very hesitant chances are they just don't have a lot of backup a lot of firepower there if however i mean if it's a platoon maybe they're trying to lure you into a trap there's always that outside possibility but Generally speaking, it's, that's usually not the case in my experience. It can happen. So there is, you know, that, that's that's one of those things that it's just a judgment call. We've got a couple of people that uh, platooned up. One of them's in a Jagdpanzer 100, and two of them are in front of you and are pulling back. Or maybe they're trying to draw you into that Jaegerus line of fire, but uh, maybe not. You know, if the Jaegerus has been spotted elsewhere, then obviously you'll, you'll know that's not the case. So yeah, minimap. Pay attention to the minimap. Uh, another thing to be aware of, um, it just again in any situation, but it's especially useful if you're in this kind of choke point when you're facing off face to face against enemy tanks, uh, it, it's really useful to have some awareness of the penetration of enemy tanks facing you. Let's say you're in a KV-1 and it's a bunch of tier 3 tanks facing you, well chances are you can just push through, because at that point you know your armour is good enough to bounce most shots. Now, it might be useful for these kind of situations to have a mod that tells you the kind of ammo that's being shot at you, because if you're going forwards and suddenly you find you're getting penetrated a lot by a lower tier tank, and you think your armor's good enough against their AP penetration, well, it, it's quite useful to know if they're just firing APCR or if maybe else you're just angling really badly and they're just able to pen a weak spot or whatever. Uh, so I would say having a mod like that's really, really useful um, because if you've got somebody that's just firing a lot of APCR at you, then you suddenly you know, okay, you have to be a bit more cautious around this person. But if they aren't and uh, you're able to push aggressively, then um, lower tier guns generally, I mean, they've got less penetration and they do less damage. So even if you do get penned once or twice, you can maybe afford to take the hits. But... Um, Sometimes even same tier tanks, I mean, myself and uh, Zed are uh, the same tier, and if I was side scraping against his gun, uh, we're actually not that far off in terms of penetration. I've got 175 average pen and he's got 171, User but in terms of channel. angling and side scraping, um, I think if I shoot at this angle I should... No, actually that did pen. Okay, I thought that might bounce, but anyway. Um, yeah, sometimes knowing what you can stand up against is is very valuable but sometimes you've just you, you don't have any idea you might not necessarily know what gun an enemy is is using in which case okay be a bit more cautious but if you know for sure the what kind of gun they've got then it can be a, a really good chance to be uh, aggressive about it and, and just start pushing forwards knowledge of where to shoot enemy tanks is also very useful i mean there are separate uh, sgta weak spot lessons and there are also very useful websites like tanks.gg any Body can basically go and look up weak spots these days. It used to be you had to drag people with the tank in question into a training room and then try and figure out where the weak spots were manually. And then we started to get tools come along like, um, uh, I can't remember what the original app was that like you see the... Uh... Tank Inspector? Well yeah, there was Tank Inspector a bit later but there was, uh, there was one before that, and I can't remember what it's called now. But there was Tank well, Inspector, nice. which is unfortunately now defunct. It was a very nice little uh, program, that. But, um, uh, what Inspector? That might have been it. Yeah. But these days, um, there's tanks.gg, there's other uh, websites that have similar information. I think tanks.gg's got the nicest layout, to be honest. Although it doesn't quite have all the info that Tank Inspector has, but, um, 
in terms of other stats, I think other websites might be a little more in depth. But uh, if it's just armor knowledge you're after, then that that is the best one. So it will uh, that kind of knowledge. I mean, you can pick it up over time anyway. But if there's specific tanks you're having trouble with, then websites like that are going to be very very useful, especially in the kind of scenarios where you'll often find yourself in a heavy tank. You will be facing other heavy tanks frontally, and. For instance, if you knew nothing about the 50B, you might go, oh, this is a French heavy tank. The hull armor is completely rubbish. I'm just gonna shoot the front of the hull. Whereas, of course, if you know about armor, you'll know that the AMX 50B has actually got the best frontal armor of any French heavy tank. It's actually got really quite respectable frontal armor generally. Always shoot the turret on a 50B. Other French heavies, you can get away with shooting the hull, but in specifically the 50B, no, it would be a waste of time. So it's that kind of specific knowledge that you, you might need. So that's kind of covering what you might do in more heavy tanks. I mean, if you're in something like the FCM 50T or an AMX 5100 or a, a VK4501 or a KV1S, KV85, you might actually more profitably uh, end up going with your medium tanks because you don't have their speed, but you're not going to be that far behind them. And also, you're going to be bringing a lot of hit points and quite a big gun to the party. And that can make all the difference on a flank. And again, uh, in fact, maybe even more so, knowing how much your armor can stand is especially useful. Because something like the VK4501 or the FCM, they don't particularly have great armor. So you've, you've got to be a bit more on your toes. You've got to be a bit more comfortable with the medium tank playstyle, even though it isn't quite the medium tank playstyle because you know these are heavy tanks really even though they don't play like you know a, a 50p and a mouse are really quite different machines so um, generally I'm going to conclude this section by saying don't be afraid to trade health but it does pay to try and keep as much of your health till the end game as possible because that's when it's most valuable um, you get to the, the kind of situation where you've got lots of more low health enemies around and if you've still got two-thirds or even more of your hit points i mean this is especially true for the french auto loaders you can sit there take a hit and do the damage yourself and if it's somebody that's a one-shot kill for you but you're not a one-shot kill for them that can make a difference that can make a, a huge difference so try not to trade away too much health too early but um Occasionally there are times when you might need to just push forward and take the hit, knowing that you're going to take the hit. And it, it's always, I, I mean, you, you'll have seen this situation yourself, I'm sure, often in, in battles where there's a very, very heavy tank, uh, a very, very hel healthy heavy tank even, sitting somewhere at the back, doing not a lot, when if they had come forward and maybe... Um, taken a bit of the strain, you know, taken a hit or two themselves and, and the damage had been spread a bit more evenly around your team, that could have made the difference between winning a flank and losing a flank, for instance, or uh, a heavy tank that just isn't willing to push, even though if they go forward and push because they've got the hit points, because they've got the armor and the best chances of uh, uh, bouncing shots, um, that again can make or break a flank. And actually it's sometimes quite useful if you're in a platoon with uh, people to have um, a platoon of, of two medium tanks and a heavy tank can be a very powerful combination, especially if it's um, oh, just uh, knocked my mouse all over the place there. Um, yeah, something like two tier 10 mediums and uh, an IS-7, for instance. You can use the IS-7 as like the breakthrough tank, and then the mediums flow through afterwards and wreak havoc, and it, it can make a, a huge difference on the battlefield. So is there any questions up till this point? Because if not, we'll... Um, no? Okay. We'll skip right on to uh, the next section, which I've taken from the uh, the uh, curriculum materials, which is specifically concerning lemming trains, which can be a problem when you're in a heavy tank because generally you're not very fast. Now, the general advice with lemming trains is... Well, there's two ways you can play it. You can either be at the front and you can try and push and keep things moving forwards because a lemming train is basically a, a whole like it most of your team's gone on one flank and the difference between that being a lemming train and a successful push is generally if they grind to a halt or not and if it's most of your team generally you're, you're going to have the superior numbers 
So in that kind of scenario, you as the individual player can make a big difference by trying to be more aggressive, trying to push things forward, and communicating with your team helps, and they're not necessarily going to speak the same language as you, but if you can give people the idea you know, that you're going to push, that you're going to make a move, sometimes they will push in behind you, and you can get that stalled loading train going again and you know, win whichever side you're on. At that point, you've got a choice of whether you push onwards or whether you go back to try and defend. Because, if, of course, if you're all all on one flank, you know, let's say it's Ensk. And again, this is the thing I've seen happen myself, and I doubtless you have as well. Everybody tends to congregate on this side of the map, and suddenly the field is completely undefended. And that can be really quite tricky. So let's say you're in this situation. You've Everyone's kind of come through here, and you've actually managed to get everyone to push through and mop up this area against inferior numbers. Now on a map like Ensk, because it's so small, it's probably going to be a much better idea for everybody to go back. On bigger maps it's more of a judgement call, let's say it's Mountain Pass for instance. Generally you will want your faster tanks to go back to defend and try and decap, and in a slower heavy tank, well, if you're in something really slow and you're closer to the enemy cap, then you might well want to continue going round to the enemy cap. But if you're in a faster heavy, you should probably f um, follow in behind your mediums, unless there is real-time pressure. Unless you absolutely have to get to the enemy cap and start capping just because there isn't any time to hunt down the rest of the enemy team. So uh, again, it, it's, it's judgement call and it, it's um, a lot more to do with the maps and knowledge of the maps that you're on, because if you can basically get control of a large area of the map and then turn around and defend your own cap. And, and in this case on Ensk, it, it's actually really quite doable. You've got some good positions in J5 and uh, K5 that you can make use of um, in something like, the, I think there's a KV4 here or the, the IS3 even, anything that you can maybe get into a good side scraping position. And especially if there's no artillery to worry about, it is possible. Channel. And I've done it on Ensk. I've basically held the enemy off the cap long enough for everybody to come back and bop up the rest of the enemy that we're trying to push around. Sometimes those actions can make a difference. Um, but there are other times when, yeah, you will want to go forward and, and, and cap yourself. And uh, it really does depend on, um, I think, not just the map. I mean, the map's important, but the kind of tank you're in as well. Um, the... I mean, I've touched on being um, in a defensive position. Um, if it's a bigger map, being on a defensive position, it's not very rewarding. Sometimes it can win games, and it's definitely easier if, if you're in a platoon, because you can coordinate better. Um, but generally speaking, you can expect to be overrun by superior numbers. It, it's almost kind of inevitable. So, um, I mean, let's take Mountain Pass, for instance, and you've gone on the glacier side, and there's only you, you've only got yourself and say maybe one or two other tanks there and there's a whole lot of enemy tanks coming towards you at which point let's say um you're actually defending up from the glacier you've got a bit of a terrain advantage because they've got to come up towards you but once they do get up there they're just if they're being sensible will just push forwards and overwhelm you with numbers so what you can do is basically try and make a fighting retreat use the little bit of cover that you've got. Use the the terrain and sort of back far around enough the mountain that you can basically peak fire, withdraw to the next bit of cover. And it will only work for so long, but it will buy you more time, and that will buy your team more time. And hopefully they're paying attention to their mini-maps, and hopefully they're going to come back and defend, and sometimes they won't, which is just part of the frustration of playing World of Tanks sometimes, but sometimes they will. And Maybe you've died in the process, but your actions will have ultimately won the game. So, yeah, Lemming Trains in particular, it's a bit of a mixed bag. It's generally maybe better to be with the Lemming Train and to try and be in control of pushing things forward, but there might be times when it calls for a bit of heroic last stand action and you're the one that has to make the sacrifice to try and hold back a flank against impossible odds. And even just very occasionally, you'll even succeed. You'll get a bunch of enemies that that are just passive enough that they will play peekaboo with you, and that they won't just rush forward and overwhelm you. 
and it actually always feels really good when you manage to hold back superior forces. It doesn't happen often, it requires a certain amount of derpiness on your enemy's part, but uh, it can happen. So, any any other any questions about that or... No? Okay. We're, we're almost done, by the way. I'm, I'm on to my final thoughts. We're actually going to get this inside of half an hour, I think. So I'm going to finish this off by saying um, the, the Wooler Tanks meta at the moment, uh, especially at the high tiers, it, it kind of favours medium tanks. And that's why you see the serious players or the, the high W8 players, people that are chasing high W8 even, and, and good stats, will tend to gravitate, uh, gravitate towards medium tanks and will just play a lot of medium tanks. And there's a reason for that, and there's also a reason why the heavy tank actually kind of fell out of use as a, an actual concept. There were a couple that survived post-war. Uh, tanks like the M103, the Conqueror, the T10 all saw service, but they were the last of their breed really, and after that it, it really became uh, medium tanks transformed into universal tanks, the MBTs as we know them today. So. Well, the tanks is kind of maybe not entirely inaccurately uh, that it reflects that, and generally it's the, the better mobility of mediums that affords them overall more flexibility. But there is, I think, still definitely a place for heavy tanks on the battlefield, and even knowing what I know about medium tanks, I still prefer playing heavy tanks. I prefer the pace of the gameplay, and I prefer the, the play style. And you can still do very well in a heavy tank. You can still make a significant contribution to a battle in a heavy tank but it can be a much more variable experience than perhaps um, playing nothing but medium tanks would be. So it's kind of a, I don't know, I don't know why it's called that, a cautionary note or just a final thought, but uh, overall, yeah, I, I feel like heavy tanks can be fun, but incredibly unreliable. And if you're wanting to get better at heavy tanks, it's maybe something you need to accept to that some heavy tank games are just going to be, you know, terrible and boring or whatever you're just gonna be too slow to get to the action whereas in other heavy tank games you're gonna be the linchpin that holds a flank together that eventually wins the game which is really satisfying so it can go both ways pointy yes if you need any help with that bunch of noobs just give me a poker <laughs> okay well we're just about done with this so if nobody has any questions we can just all murder suicide each other and uh finish the lesson and i'm the first to die of course let's see you guys let's see you buffer User left down. so yeah this this actually might be my my quickest lesson ever that i've done <laughs> i think this has been like 25 minutes so that's that's not bad i think we <laughs> covered a good amount of stuff there and if you want a refresher of any of this it's basically all in the curriculum materials i embellished it a bit and sort of added some of my own experience in but uh, yeah, it, it's it's all based on that, and there's a lot more stuff with heavy tanks besides, you know, specific techniques and, and things like getting to learn the autoloader specifically. But uh, I, I expect there are specific lessons and specific bits of the curriculum material for that for those that are interested. So, did everyone everyone enjoy themselves? Yeah, thank you. That was an excellent yeah. lesson. Really <laughs> good <much>. information. <clears throat> It's interesting to know your take on heavy tanks and the greater scheme of things. Because um, as a new player, everyone says, ah, oh, go for the KV-1. And I got that, and I, you know, I'm hovering at the sort of 48% mark. Got up to the KV-1S, and I've just got my one and only um, ace tanker. So, um, who knows? <laughs> it's just... Yeah, there are, there are some, I mean, some heavy tank lines. The IS-7 line in particular is quite favoured by... Um, just because they have more mobility generally, they're not as hindered in that regard as some of the other heavy tank lines. So they are maybe more favoured by people that like that, that faster playstyle but still um, want a bit of armour on their heavy tanks. Whereas something like the French heavy tank line is a completely different experience and it's um, that's almost you'd almost have to do a separate lesson for the, the French heavies because they really don't play like other nations heavies maybe at tier five they're more comparable but you get to tier six and upwards and um, they're a rather different sort of a beast what do you think of the um, the german heavies i mean I, I haven't gone down that route at all but they sound like they're quite a, a tricky proposition because you've got an enormous tank but an excellent gun 
It's a sort of sniping heavy, as far as I can tell. Y yes and no. Um, I mean, that's definitely not true of the uh, the E100, for instance. It's got a very derpy gun, for instance. Um, uh, but it, it kind of... Yeah, it depends. They're actually less, uh, I would say, if, if I bring up the tech tree, actually, less um, consistent as an experience overall, the Germans... Um, I'll actually dismiss the room because it's actually uh, it's not letting me look at the tech tree for some reason. So the the way the Tiger plays, for instance, is quite different than or, or the Tiger P. Going from the Tiger P to the VK four five zero two A is uh, really uh, quite a step change. Uh, and then going from the VK A to the VK B again, the, the VK A is a real oddity at, at, on that line because um, it, it doesn't fit with the rest of them at all, and. Um, Again, going from the 3601 to the Tiger's not maybe that huge of a change, but going from the Tiger 1 to the Tiger 2 actually is a reasonably big change. And then you go to the E75. I think, honestly, the E75 is, for a lot of people, the pinnacle of that line. And the VKB is possibly a bit overpowered these days. Um, but there are people that swear by the other tanks uh, as well. I know the Tiger 2 gets a lot of fans. Um, the E100, you see a fair few of those around the mouse, maybe less so, but... Um, as a line, yeah, it's maybe not that consistent. There are some gems on there, but a lot of people go for spe specific tanks, so they might only want the Tiger or the Tiger Two, or they, they might stop at the E75, for instance. But uh, for consistency, I mean, I think the, the IS-7 line probably is one of the best ones. I think it's one of the, the reasons why it gets recommended as um, for, for new tank players, because uh, it, it has that better measure of consistency and it, they've, they've got decent mobility they've got decent armor they've got well okay-ish guns they're a bit derpy because they're soviet guns but uh, they're, they're decent all-rounders so any any other specific questions i mean it could be about specific tanks specific tank lines i don't mind or if uh, not uh, i guess we can just wrap things up there So there we are. I hope if you did watch all the way through that you found it useful and interesting. This is a bit of a test balloon, so I will be interested to see the feedback from it. So uh, yes, do feel free to share any thoughts or comments you have below. So otherwise, uh, you can hit the like button if you want to see more or just leave a comment saying you're interested in seeing more. Obviously, um, that's all useful feedback. Uh, you can sub to my channel if you haven't already. And as always, stay tuned for more.